Hey guys, we are back at it again this week for this week's show. We're um, at a golf access home. This is uh, Andy and our zoo's property that we purchased. You might remember it from a previous video. And just wanted to come out since we're talking about golf access living, uh, waterfront living. Um, wanted to put this in the background for you. But anyway, we are going to be uh, discussing some of the challenges of waterfront living here in Cape Coral, Florida. And I also am gonna be showing you some of the tools and apps that you can use if you're gonna be boating. Uh, we're gonna talk about different ways to use these waterfront properties. And once again, some of the challenges uh, that you'll come upon uh, when you're living in this kind of setup. So stay tuned, watch the whole thing, make sure you're getting all the tips and tricks, and we're getting after it next. Okay, so first of all, you know that Cape Coral is made up of 400 miles of canals, right? And that also doesn't include the lakes and ponds. Yes, they're actually ponds. If you're from up north, they're not lakes. Um, <laughs> anyway, with that said, you have to think about how you're going to use the water. So if you want to be waterfront, um, are you using it to kayak, paddleboard, um, potentially just go fishing? Well, then you can be on a freshwater canal. You save yourself a boatload of money. Um, one of the things you have to consider is the cost. So when you're doing your budgeting um, for golf access, you're looking at about $200,000 plus for the lot. Uh, so that can definitely eat into your budget for the home. Um, but the other thing is the fresh water, you can get those lots 20, 30,000 in some cases. So it's not a ton of money, uh, much easier to get on, but you're not going anywhere. Uh, in that case, if you're going to do boating, you'll end up having to store it like I do, or you'll end up uh, trailering. So we're going to be talking about some of those different ways of doing the boat as well. Uh, one of the other major, major considerations, if you are somebody that is going to absolutely have a large boat, don't make the mistake of buying the house first. Because one of the things that you have to know is that the bridge heights will mess with you. And perfect example, I was talking to one of the uh, service people over at the boathouse, not the restaurant boathouse, there's also one called the boathouse for boat sales. And in this situation, one of their clients bought a 33 foot center console with radar and everything on top. You know what the problem was? They couldn't get the boat under the bridge to deliver it. Yeah, they had to get it under the bridge and had to wait for the tidal changes, had to um, basically weigh down the boat as much as they could to drop it into the water more to get underneath these bridges. So if you buy a house and don't have the boat yet, you're probably gonna have to look at restricting the size to under 30 feet. Uh, Cause once you get over 30, uh, they tend to sit a little bit higher out of the water and it could be problematic for you. Uh, one thing you can do though, is look at the other boats that are behind uh, that bridge that you're considering possibly buying and see if those boats are similar to the one that you want. Because if they are, then there's a very good chance that you're not gonna have that problem. But please, don't make the mistake. Let's, uh, let's address that first and foremost, uh, because the last thing I want my clients to do is to end up purchasing a home and not being able to use it the way they intend to use it. So since we're talking about the different ways to do the boating, um, if you're going to uh, be in this kind of situation here, uh, I'll show you what, what uh, Andy's got set up over here. At this point, it is literally just the big old dock. Okay, so you can see right there, he's got the, the wraparound dock and he could very well do what they did across the, the water over there and put the lift in. Um, that can come later, it doesn't need to be right now. The first thing that he needed to do is secure the property on golf access. And he just wants to be able to have the option to go out in open water if he wants to. He doesn't even know if he's going to. Um, from what our conversation, it seems like he just wants to be able to tool around the canals. And there's a ton of them to tool around in. So if that's your goal too, don't worry about it. Not that big of a deal. Another challenge that we really have to, to discuss is if you're gonna be on any kind of water, there's a restriction on how big your dock can be. So it's not supposed to take up any more than a quarter of the distance across the canal or up to 40 feet. And there's a reason for that. We need, if somebody has a, um, a dock on the other side, like this home over here, and it's right across from ours, 
what's gonna happen? It's gonna be very difficult to navigate, right? So you have to leave that whole center section. 50% of the canal has to be open for boat traffic. The other thing that you have to consider is the size of your boat. So you may want the big boat to go out in the Gulf and go fishing and have it all sturdy and everything. Well, make sure the canal that you're buying on, uh, we, we talked about the bridges. How about the width of the canal? Aside from how big your dock can be and stretching out into the canal, the other thing you have to consider is the size of your boat. Yes, you may want the big boat to go out fishing deep in the Gulf, but can you turn it around in the canal that you bought on? If you get a small 80 foot canal, you're not gonna have a lot of space to turn around. Um, keep that in mind. Also, if you wanna go to restaurants and things, there's not gonna be a lot of parking in some cases. So if you have a 35 foot boat and you're trying to dock it at a place that say like Cabbage Key, I mean, that place gets packed on a weekend. You may not have anywhere to park. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna turn tail and find somewhere else to go but that's a real challenge that you can come upon. So bigger isn't always better. And in those cases, I have a 22 footer. I can squeeze into most places that I need to. Yet it's a, it's a deep V, so it allows me to weather some of the bigger waves without having to worry about it. So keep it in mind when you're choosing your boat, what it's for, how well you can handle it, the canal you're gonna be going into, it's all gonna play a part. Um, I do have an app I want to show you or a part of the website that will help you determine how long it's going to take you to get out to open water or to any other destination. So we're going to jump into that real quick and give you a little highlight of how you're going to use this next tool. When you get in here to the, the uh, property search, you go to the left hand, see the, the tab right there, the header that says property search. We're going to hit that. And then we're going to make sure we're on the map setting. But what this is going to do for you is allow you to measure distances. And why is that important, you ask? Well, if I'm looking for a golf access property and I want to know how long it's going to take me to get to the lock. So the lock is right down here in this area. Rum Runners, if you see that down there. Let's just say there's a property I'm looking at above Beach Parkway here. I need to find out how long it's going to take to get out. Well, right here on the map, you'll see there's a header that says map, distance, draw, and search on the moving map. I'm gonna hit distance. And then over, over on the side here, you'll see it's gonna start calculating this. So I start where, I, where the property's gonna be. I hit, a, hit that to put the pin down. Then I just measure the distances across the canals and show how I'm gonna get out. And just every time I click the mouse, it's going to drop a pin and the measurement from the one pin to the next. And you just measure this all the way down the path and to the lock. So what does that give us? 5.68 miles. So if the speed in these canals is five miles an hour, what's that tell you? You're going to take just over an hour from that location. So all golf access is not created equal. If you look at some of these places that are considered golf access that are up even further by Veterans Parkway, I won't even tell a client that that's golf access. It's not fair. It's not right. Does the water still connect to golf access water? Sure. Is it navigable? Eh, if the boat's small enough, but the pipe that you have to, yes, I said pipe. It's a storm drain pipe. Um, that is about eight and a half feet from the water surface to the top of that pipe. But remember, a pipe's rounded. So you're gonna have problems with say a T-top going underneath there. There aren't many boats on the other side of that particular uh, bridge, but it's still considered golf access. So if you wanna use this tool to measure distances, um, I'll be happy to uh, do a Zoom call with anybody just to go through this part of it, but useful tool to find out how far you're going to go how long it's going to take you. And hell, even if you're going to visit friends that are up a canal system, you're going to know exactly how long it's going to take because you can just keep drawing this out as far as you want to. Okay, so you see how cool that tool is, right? How it's going to show you to know how far you're going to go to get the things. You know that you can only go five miles an hour in these canals because of the uh, manatees. So the slow zones there. Um, so Use that tool. If you need help with it, like I said, I can do a Zoom call with you and walk you through the steps of how to get to it and how to do it. Uh, but 
Outside of that, there is another um, app that I wanna show you real quick. And this one is specifically for the weather. And it's for all those people, if you're not uh, familiar with uh, boating in the ocean uh, or in the Gulf, and you just know lakes from up north, I grew up on, on Lake Erie, right? So I did boating when I was a teenager, late teen too. And it made me a little apprehensive coming to saltwater and trying to navigate here because you hear all the horror stories about running aground and you gotta have sea tow, which, which is true. Get sea tow, Boat USA, whatever it is, because the last thing you wanna do is have boat problems and then not have the insurance because you will pay through the nose. Anyway, um, you really have to pay attention. Uh, we're gonna discuss things like channel markers. You need to watch for channel markers. They're red and they're green. And you have to understand that if you don't stay between them and you try to trail off somewhere and you don't have a flats boat uh, or a bay boat, a hybrid boat, whatever, something that goes in really skim water, you could run aground and be one of those sea tow victims. <laughs> but the other thing you have to do is look at your instrument panels and look at um, the apps that are gonna give you the information for when you're ready to go out boating. And I'm gonna introduce you to the first one right now, it's called the Windy. The Windy app and show you, this is an app that you use to check the weather before you go out on the boat. As you can see, uh, this is on the wind setting right now, it's 56 degrees. And if we zoom in to the area that we're going to go, which I go out of Charlotte Harbor. So you put the little crosshairs on the area you're gonna be in. You can see the wind's 13 miles an hour there right now. If you go down to the red circle on the right and hit that, you can switch it to waves. So now I hit the wave section and it tells us that the waves are approximately two feet. Now I went out the other day and the wind was maybe six miles an hour and it said zero feet. And when I got out there, it was like glass. I mean, this is what it looked like. So aside from this, if you go all the way to the bottom and you see the date saying Saturday the 20th at 10 a.m., I can put my, put my finger on that and scroll to whatever hour I'm gonna be out. So if I'm out at five o'clock, I know I'm coming back. At five o'clock, the waves are still gonna be two feet. Now, if I keep scrolling out to the Gulf, they go up to three feet. And obviously the further you go out, four feet, it's just gonna get rougher. Anyway, this will allow you to go anywhere in the area and see what the forecast is gonna bring you. Um, let's see, go up the river. River's only a foot. That's why the people that are off of the, the river section there can sometimes be boating on a day that you know, other folks aren't going to just because of these waves. But that's how you navigate through um, this particular program. And uh, Windy is my go-to. It seems to be very uh, consistent. And if you have any other questions about it, you know, shout a comment down below or call, text, or email. I'll help you through it. Okay, so you can see how that might help you. And it is very accurate. I used it the other day um, and it was absolutely spot on with how the weather was, how the waves were. Um, the next thing I wanna show you is actually the instrument panel in the boat. If you're not familiar with the GPS, I'll just show you a couple of the highlight things. The one spot you really wanna pay attention to is when it gets into the, um, the tides, the tidal changes. So as you can see here, it's gonna give you the depth. It's going to also uh, show you what time it is. It's gonna give you water temperature, uh, voltage in your batteries, all those um, pieces of information that you may like to have. But when you scroll through, and mine's under the info tab, it took me a while to bounce around and find it because it's been a while. But I do this almost every time I'm out for one reason. I like to go to the sandbar, the Boca Grande sandbar. Now, don't go invading the place because it does get full sometimes. But what's really cool is that you can either get out and use the water or you can choose not to. It's always crystal clear, beautiful green, uh, wonderful temperatures, you get the breezes, the current coming through there. Um, but the one thing you want to know is, is the tide going to be going up or down? Reason is, if I pull up on that sandbar too far and I'm not paying attention to the tidal change and it's going into low tide, I could end up stuck on that sandbar. Um, so the other day we were going out and I noticed the tide was going, it's, it's going towards high tide. So what did that tell me? I know that I can get in there comfortably, put down the dual power poles and just 
wait it out because the tide's only going to increase. Um, so I am not gonna have the chance of getting stuck there, but don't make the mistake that I made. And I ran myself in a little too close to the sandbar and the props started chewing sand. So yeah, you can still make mistakes. Um, thankfully, that's my worst mistake so far. So knock on, I don't, well, hold on. I think I found some wood. Hold on a second. Knock that out. Anyway, um, so use your instrument panel. It's there for a reason. You definitely want to use it here. And now we've got our landscapers. So regardless of how well you try to situate yourself into a, a nice place that's quiet and relaxing and chilling out, this is gonna happen. It is a Saturday, so um, a lot of these guys are out working. Okay, I'm coming back out to try and do this. The inside wasn't working, but anyway, um, one of the things I wanna share with you too is there's a map of all the waterfront destinations for dining. So one of the big things boaters do here is they wanna to go to restaurants. They wanna check things out. They wanna see what these places are like, what the food's like, because driving to some of them one of the ones that I'm really wanting to go to is called Farlow's. It's up in uh, Englewood. The problem is, is that it's gonna take me over an hour to drive there. If I take the boat, I'm probably gonna cut that down to about 45 minutes. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's a lot more fun rolling up on a boat than driving up in a car. So if you want that map, um, I did, I did uh, put it on the screen. I have it as a PDF, I can send it to you. So go ahead, text, email, call, whatever you need to do, comment down below with an email address and I'd be happy to send you a copy so that you too can go and explore all these wonderful waterfront dining opportunities. Now one of your considerations when you're choosing where you're gonna be boating, um, if you're off to the southeast side of the uh, Cape, you're gonna be in the river. The river is, the water's kind of dark over there. It's kind of like Coca-Cola water. Uh, it's a brown color. But if you come out towards uh, Burnstorm Marina, where I take my boat. We're gonna go inside for a second again. Um, what happens is you end up with um, more of that green emerald colored, um, the emerald colored waters, uh, like it's at the sandbar, and it's absolutely gorgeous. So different types of water you're gonna deal with. Okay, so when we're talking about some of the expenses, uh, you, already, you already know that we said that the, the golf access lots um, you're looking at 200,000 to 500,000 on average for a lot, if you're gonna build on it. Um, so that's where the biggest part of your expense comes right out the gate. And then you'll be adding a dock and a lift. So that's more expense, right? You're probably another 25 to 50,000, depending on how extravagant you wanna go with this. And then we have to weigh against storage. My storage bill is just over $400 a month. Um, so it's going to take me many, many, many months to catch up to that uh, 200 plus number that it would be if I lived on Golf Access. Um, but storage can still be, you know, if you got a bigger boat, you can still be paying a thousand a month for that. So you have to shop around, check the different marinas, find out what the rates are, find out uh, if they can even accommodate your boat. And once you have a storage place, I treat it kind of like Packers tickets. You don't give them up. So if you've got it, hold on to it. I paid for my space in that building six months before my boat was even delivered, just so that I had a spot. Um, but the last way obviously is trailering. This is where your expenses are very low. It literally comes down to just maintaining the boat. Um, you know, you'll have to run and get gas and, and put it in your boat once in a while, or you just drive the boat into the gas station and fill it up there, right? but it's not gonna be as expensive uh, to store it. You throw it in your backyard, Cape Coral allows you to stick it in the backyard and you won't experience the challenges of where to put it. Okay, so another major concern when you're talking about these golf access waters, and again, uh, we talked about the title changes, but you know what, I almost forget sometimes because I put my boat in at the marina, I dock at the marina, um, I'm docking at marinas, um, in most cases when I am going to restaurants and things, but I haven't experienced yet a lot of current that's pushing me as I'm trying to dock. That is a real concern in some cases. There are some waterways here, depending on the tide changes, that you may find that you're being pushed and you will find with a single engine like I have, it's a lot harder to control. I've, I've been told that twin engines and trips and all that, they are 
fabulous for that reason. It allows you a lot more control. But again, single engine here, so things like current can definitely play a part. Um, and you have to pay attention to which way the wind is blowing also because um, if your boat does not sit that deep in the water, it can, be a, it can be much more susceptible to being pushed across the water. I experienced this with a hurricane deck boat when I rented it before I bought my boat. And I asked them about it uh, at the rental place. What's the deal with trying to dock this thing? It feels like it's sliding right across the water. And they said that it is because it doesn't sit deep enough in the water to really grab hold of anything and the wind will just push it right across. So keep that in mind when you're buying your boat as well, um, how it's gonna sit, how it's gonna react in the water and try to make your experience as hassle-free as possible. Now real quick, let's, let's just discuss the building process because if you're building on a canal like this, first thing is golf access is much different than freshwater. Freshwater, you do not have to have a seawall. You can have what they call a riprap. Riprap is basically a bunch of stones that are kind of stacked along the, uh, the bank and it serves as kind of a barrier so it doesn't uh, erode the dirt too fast. Uh, but it's also because there's not, there's not tidal changes on freshwater. So you don't have the, the same concerns. But if you are on golf access, one thing you have to know about is mangroves. If it's even the smallest plant, you could very well end up in a huge delay going through a bunch of hoops. I mean, Eric is one of my clients. He bought a gorgeous lot. This thing is absolutely spectacular. The view is on a basin on the spreader up in the Northwest. Unbelievable. However, he had a mangrove on the, on the property. It took him, must've been a year and a half to go through the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and to go through a couple other governmental hoops that they're throwing at him. Uh, I think he might finally be clear of it so he could start building, but uh, that is a huge undertaking. And also, seawalls can get rather expensive. We've had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of damage from Ian. Obviously, expenses went through the roof. Uh, so did the request to get the work done. So a lot of the vendors are just stacked and it's hard to keep up. Uh, and here in Cape Coral, the seawalls fall on the owners responsibility. So if something happens at seawall, it's not in your taxes like it is in Punta Gorda. Um, so it's not going to be repaired by the city. You have to take that on yourself. Um, so in this home, we, I just talked to the agent for uh, Andy and our zoo, the, the listing agent that we bought this uh, through. And we just got um, the report back on the seawall and it's all good. It's a clean report. So that gives us the peace knowing going forward, there's not going to be any real maintenance issues to start off with. Is these things, they're going to be tens of thousands of dollars to replace if you have to. Now, one of the other concerns that you have if you're going to live on the water, uh, again, salt water versus fresh water, salt water is also tidal, right? So tidal changes can affect these canals. Normally, the changes aren't too extreme as you get further away from uh, the open source of the water, but I want to show you something because you can see the water line changes on the seawall over there. See that dark color and then it gets white on top? Well, that dark strip that's, that's there, that is how high the water goes in high tide. So you have to be aware of those things. But what's, what the reason why I wanted to point this one out to you was flood insurance. Everybody's very concerned about flood insurance right now, right? And you only have um, the extreme ability to be flooded the way Ian did if you're in a canal that has the actual tidal changes because the fresh water is literally just rainwater runoff and it would be extremely difficult for you to experience the kind of flooding that would happen say in these um, Gulf access canals because the water here when it gets pushed back in it's it's out of our control it doesn't happen in fresh water so keep that in mind if you want to avoid uh, potentially avoid some flood insurance then you want to um, look at the freshwater canals and if you don't really care if you're going out into open water that might be the better play for you now on these freshwater canals um, yes they're they're great for certain entertainment um, but the one thing you're not going to do people ask me all the time why don't we see people swimming in the canals well, in golf access, whatever's in the golf or in the ocean is gonna be in these canals. 
Manatees will come an hour up the canal system. That means if a manatee gets up here and how big they are, there could be sharks, there could be stingray, there could be barracuda, all that stuff could be up here. Um, freshwater. What's the one thing that everybody asks me about in any kind of water in Florida? Gators, yes. So gators can be in any water. Um, they will go in the salt water too. They just don't prefer it. I have yet to see one in a pool. I know you'll see pictures of that on the internet, but it's not as common as they're showing. And no, I've never had a gator at my front door. So rest easy on that. It's not something that's common. So it most likely won't happen to you. Okay, so I think that pretty much does it for uh, giving you some of the challenges of buying a waterfront property in Cape Coral, Florida. Um, I'm sure there's some things I missed. I tried to rack my brain on this and really pay attention to the things I've heard from others, my experiences. Um, I'd be happy to share any of it with you. So comment down below if there's anything you wanna know that I didn't talk about um, and we'll address it as we go. If you have any questions, uh, maybe I didn't address things and you wanna know more about living in the area, check out one of these other videos. And if you have a specific question that you need an answer to, you've got to call, text, or email because I've got your back when moving to the Gulf Coast.